year 1066, a year that will become the most famous in English history. In the epic battle that was fought here, England was lost to a foreign power, the Normans. It's January, and some bad news has just reached the court of William, Duke of Normandy. Amongst the court is the churchman, William of Poitiers. He's a Norman historian, and he's telling the story his way from the Norman point of view. A report was brought to Normandy, quite unexpectedly, that England had lost its king, Edward the Confessor. Moreover, it said that Harold Godwinson, on the tragic day when the king was buried, while all the people were mourning, seized the royal throne. But Duke William is furious, an arch opportunist. He also has the English throne in his sights. More than this, he claims that Edward had actually promised him the throne, and that Harold Godwinson had sworn to accept him as king. Duke William decided to avenge his injury with arms. Ships were built and equipped with weapons and men. But when all was ready, unfavorable winds forced William to wait with his ships at the mouth of the river Dee. Meanwhile, King Harold has other problems. England is already being invaded by Vikings. The Norwegian Harold Hardrada and King Harold's own brother, Tosti, have landed on the northeast coast and overrun the city of York. Harold reacts like lightning, marching his troops the 200 miles from London to Stamford Bridge in five days, catching the Vikings unaware. They're defeated, and Harold and his troops can draw breath and celebrate a major victory. But as they do so, far away on the coast of France, the waiting for William comes to an end. At last, the expected wind began to blow. Carried by a favorable breeze, the Normans reached land at Pelz and disembarked easily without having to offer battle. They occupied Pevensey with a first fortification, and then Hastings with a second. Harold's men quickly marched south to confront the Normans. On the night of October the 13th, Duke William's men know that Harold is coming. The Normans are seasoned fighters, but what they're facing tomorrow is an army as large as their own, some five to seven thousand strong. William goes amongst his men, making sure they see him, calm, keen for the fight, certain that right is on his side. At last, the night is past. It's Saturday, the 14th of October, and William turns to practical matters, the battle formation. He placed foot soldiers in front, armed with arrows and crossbows. Likewise, foot soldiers in the second rank, but more powerful and wearing hauberks. Finally came the squadrons of mounted knights, in the middle of which he himself rode with the strongest force. Harold has chosen his position on a hill north of Hastings. His battle formation is very different from William's because the English fight on foot. Also, the men are already exhausted after two force marches and a major battle. The English pack densely together, forming a shield wall. Wait. A hard array of trumpets gave the signal for battle on both sides. The Normans swiftly and boldly took the initiative in the fray. The foot soldiers closed to attack the English, killing and maiming men. The English, for their part, resisted bravely. Each one by any means it could devise. They threw javelins and missiles of various kinds, murderous axes, and stones tied to sticks. The Normans failed completely to force a gap in the English shield wall. Suddenly, a rumor spreads that William has been killed. 
This is a dreadful blow. They start to lose heart. Meanwhile, the English are still hacking and slashing and stabbing at them, and never give an inch. Terrified by this ferocity, both the foot soldiers and the Breton knights on the left wing turn tail. Almost the whole of the Duke's battle line gave way. The English break ranks and pursue the fleeing Normans, determined to finish them off. Howard, fighting on foot in the thick of the battle, can do nothing about the situation. But William is on horseback. He sees what's happening in Anderson. Seeing the men pursued by a great part of the opposing force, the Duke rushed towards them. Lifting his helmet and burying his head, he cried, Look at me! I am alive! And with God's help, I shall conquer! Duke William rushed forward and branched his sword. He surrounded the palace from the sea and destroyed every last one. Though many of their fellow soldiers have fallen, the English re-established the battle line. It's early afternoon now, and for the past six hours, both English and Normans have been fighting continuously at full stretch. The men are dying in their hundreds, but the Normans never stop attacking, while the English defence is as ferocious as ever. Their troops still stand so densely packed that the dead cannot fall. But now William has an idea. When previously his left flank broke and was pursued by the English, it was almost disaster, but turned to success. So why not do it again? They turned around and deliberately pretended to flee. Encouraging each other with joyful shouts, some thousands of the English rushed in pursuit. The Normans, suddenly wheeling round their horses, encircled them and slaughtered them to the last man. It's a good trip, but not quite good enough. If William can thin out the English lines still further, he's confident he can break that wall. He brings up his bow, firing hard, the arrows ringing down on the English. As the crisis of the battle approaches, one of those arrows seems to strike King Harold. Some say he is in the eye. The Normans break through at last. One of the first things they do is to find Harold and hack him down. Towards the end of the day, the English army realized there was no hope of resisting the Normans. The king himself, his brother, and many of the nobles of the kingdom were all dead. So they turned to escape. The Normans pursued them relentlessly, slashing their guilty backs and putting the finishing touches to the victory. So it's all over. In an age when a large town has a population of perhaps two and a half thousand people, as a result of this day's fighting, seven thousand men are lying dead in the field of blood. In a few years' time, William will order an abbey to be built on this spot to commemorate those who fell here. By December the 25th, Christmas Day, William, Duke of Normandy, is crowned King of England in Westminster Abbey. Within this one year, 1066, a kingdom has been lost and won. The English crown has passed from Edward to Howell to William. And the Anglo-Saxon age is finished.
Thank you for watching. More videos from Kent, England coming soon.